Good morning, church family. Whew, what an awesome start to the day. Uh, greetings to those of you watching online. I'm so glad you're with us. Uh, we love you. We, we pray that you've been blessed already and will continue to be. Well, I'm honored to share the message today, and I'm so glad that we're spending winter in the Psalms, aren't you? Oh, wait. Some, summer? It's, it's summer. Okay. All right. Per summer in the Psalms. Uh, I, I love the Psalms. The Psalms have always been a personal favorite of mine. Uh, I, I love them I, just when I need to hear from God, when I need some encouragement, I, I crack open the Psalms. And what's so great about reading the Psalms is you can start anywhere. Uh, the, you don't have to follow a Bible reading plan. You know, what's your favorite number? Read that Psalm. What's your favorite football team, 49ers? What's Psalm 49 got to say? Why not? Pick a number, any number between 1 and 150. They're all winners. And what I also love about Psalms is their poetry. They're meant to be read differently than other parts of the Bible. They're not narrative. They're not a story. They're not history. The Psalms was the Israelites' hymn book or I guess in today's language, uh, the Spotify playlist. Uh, it, it was their worship. And so the Psalms were written to be sung. Have you ever read a song lyric without the music? They, they don't always sound quite as catchy. This hit, that ice cold. Michelle Pfeiffer, that white gold. This one for them hood girls. Them good girls, straight masterpieces, styling, wiling, living it up in the city. Got chucks on with St. Laurent, got to kiss myself, I'm so pretty. <laughs> That's not from the Psalms. Without music, sometimes the words don't sound quite so catchy and inspiring, but you know when the beat drops for Uptown Funk, we all gonna be dancing. Sorry, media team, I got the order wrong. They were going to play the first few beats for us. But I told them the video was first and I mucked up. We'll, we'll have to dance it out later. Those were the lyrics from Uptown Funk, in case you were wondering. Okay. And I wonder if that was what it was like when the choir director got that lute player to pluck that first note. When the timbrel shook its first sound, the people would be stomping their feet and singing along or if the tone was one of adoration and contemplation that swayed to the holy sound reverberating from the harp. And so it's not surprising that many of our ancient hymns and even our contemporary worship songs come straight out of the Psalms. And uh, here's a tip. If you want to mix up your time with the Lord, uh, go to YouTube and just put in a psalm and, and find out if there's a worship song to it. I bet you there is. So today we're going to dive into the song that is Psalm 40. Uh, those of you with your Bibles out, we're at Psalm 40. If you want to get your version app going, there are notes there to follow along. And as always, we'll have the scripture up on the screen. Psalm 40 is about the good news of deliverance after waiting for God's rescue. But partway through, we realize that it's not over. Rescue is still required. And we end with somewhat of a cliffhanger, but with the expectation that what God did before, he will do again. And while earlier I've just said that you can read each psalm in isolation, there's actually a flow from Psalm 37, uh, where the theme of waiting has been first introduced and then this was expounded further in Psalms 38 and 39. And then we arrive in Psalm 40, where we see its triumphant outcome. And we can split this psalm into two sections. The first is verses 1 through 10, which tells of waiting rewarded. David has been delivered. David's the author of this psalm. King David, you know, David and Goliath, that guy. You've probably heard of him. Uh, He's been delivered from something which gives him a new song to sing. He wants to celebrate. And while he doesn't explain what he's been delivered from, I think this is actually good. Because this open question invites us in. 
It means that whenever we need God's deliverance, whatever we're facing, we can turn to this psalm as an encouragement. So let's get into it. Let's read the opening verses. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. This psalm begins with a testimony of rescue from a pit. As I've already mentioned, we don't know whether this pit was was a circumstance that was physical in nature, psychological, spiritual, but it gives the sense of a sucking, drowning situation, very hopeless and where rescue is only possible by the supernatural intervention of God. A a modern depiction of what David is describing uh, could be seen in this short video clip, Media. Are we good to go? All right. Here's your dean. Dad, he's sinking! Huh? Get a rope, Bar. No, that's okay. I'm pretty sure I can struggle my way out. First, I'll just reach in and pull my legs out. Now I'll pull my arms out with my face. Ah, Homer. (laughs) Homer Simpson, he's always a useful parable of what not to do, right? And, you know, I'm being cool. Like, the kids still watch The Simpsons, right? Right? (laughs) But uh, in this clip, I I think we've got a pretty good representation of what we sometimes do. Uh, even as we're sinking into whatever is overwhelming us, we're like, hey, I'm fine, I've got this, I I just need some leverage, I just need to think my way through this, Um, I can do this, I'll grab it, I've I've got got it, I can lift myself up. But the reality is that we need God, and we need His saving help. And God is so willing and able to do it. But we... We do need to ask. We need to ask for help. And in the asking, we also have to wait for his response, for his rescue. And David is such a wonderful modeler of this because even as he is in the pit, in verse 1, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. Like, I'm just picturing that. Can you imagine like, oh, I'm sinking, but I'm just waiting for God's rescue. But, but the verb here that, that's being used is literally to look keenly. So this isn't a passive sit back, I'll just let the fates take me as they will. This is like a watcher scrutinizing the horizon, expecting, waiting, looking for help. So watching for the Lord to act is neither aimless nor hopeless for those who trust him. And it's not a matter if, if God is going to rescue, but when. And so what is our waiting stance? What do we do in those waiting moments? Do we stare at the muddy pit, wallowing as we're being swallowed? Or do we look with expectancy to the horizon for our help? And here's one for all the Lord of the Rings fans. They're all sitting at this table. Thanks, guys. If you ever want to play like really hard, trivial pursuit, Lord of the Rings, Chandler and Chris, they've got you. Spoiler alert if no one's read the book or seen the movies. So in the two towers, there's this battle, the battle for Helm's Deep. Guys, don't call me out if I get any of this wrong, all right? And, and our heroes, they're battling valiantly, but it looks like they're outnumbered. They're, they're having to retreat further into the keep. They're overrun. And yet there was this message from Gandalf that said, look to my coming on the first light of the fifth day at dawn, look to the east. But it seems like they're not going to last that long. It's bad, it's dark. Too many people have died. But then our hero, Aragorn, oh, Aragorn, he remembers Gandalf's words that that Gandalf's going to return on the fifth morning in the east. We don't know why or how, 
but he encourages King Theoden to ride out on horseback with his men, not to give up hope, even though it looks hopeless. And as the sun rises, they see Gandalf arrive with reinforcements. Woo! And the tide of battle is turned despite heavy losses. They are saved. Huzzah! Did I do all right, guys? Is all right? Okay, okay. Whew. I love this, this picture because battle, when you're in the battle and things look hopeless, what do we do? How do we wait? And in those moments, how do we think about God? How do we remember his character? Do we remember his promises? Do we remember the testimony of scripture, of our own lives? And wait. And in the waiting, look keenly to the horizon for our rescue. In verse 2 of Psalm 40, we get the, the beautiful image of God's rescue as he pulls, as he plucks the psalmist out of the pit and sets his feet on solid ground. What a contrast from sinking to standing. The rescue that we read in these first lines demands a celebration. Deliverance is not complete without publicly honoring the deliverer. We need to honor God when he delivers us. And this kind of praise, it's contagious. And, and the song of testimony that the psalmist gives enables others to see that God acts with power to save those who call to him so that they too may reverence and trust in him. Let's read on from verse 4. Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. Oh, Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. You take no delight in sacrifices or offerings. Now that you have made me listen, I, I finally understand you don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come, as is written about me in the scriptures. I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. The psalmist is speaking about the blessing of a relationship with God. Verse 4, the joys of those who trust the Lord. But he cautions that these blessings can only be enjoyed when we are totally committed to God and don't also rely on other sources, the proud, those who worship idols. We're not meant to hedge our bets and be like, oh, take a bit of encouragement from God. But you know what? I'm also, I'm also going to get a bit of encouragement from this source over here and these people. Maybe some of my financial security over here. God is the only one that we can truly put our trust in. And, and we can do that because we look at the wonders he has done in history and in our lives. And because of the wonders he has planned for our future. Verse 5. O oh Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. Like, that's pretty good. Like, we've got plans A through Z, but, like, this is too numerous to list. Like, God's got us covered. This is good. And a holy God, he does have some requirements for those who want to be in relationship with him. And we know that, that historically the Israelites were to make various sacrifices and offerings to demonstrate their devotion to God and to make atonement for their sin. But these sacrifices were only symbols of the people's obedience and repentance. They were not an end in themselves. Verse 6, you take no delight in sacrifices or offerings. Now that you have made me listen, I finally understand you don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. So the question there is, what, what does God require then? And obviously, we're in the new covenant. We're looking back on this with hindsight. We know that Jesus has made a way for us. But I think 
We need to make sure we, we, we get this key to a relationship with God, which is obedience to his will revealed in his word. This requires open ears to hear what God is saying. And, and David says this. He's like, now that you've made me listen, I, I finally get it. I finally understand. The Hebrew word for hear also means obey. So once again, a bit like waiting, which is not meant to be passive, hearing is not passive either. It requires action. We see this in James chapter 1, verse 22. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. If we love God, we action what he tells us. How do we find out what he tells us? In his word, in scripture. And it's the least we can do. Otherwise, we're a bit like Homer trying to pull ourselves out of the tar pit with our faces. The statement in verse 7, I have come or here I am. And verse 8, I take joy in doing your will or I desire to do your will. Indicate that David is submitting his life to God and making God's will his will. That's a, that's a big deal in a world of individualism where it's like, no, no, my truth is my truth. David says, no, your will is my will. This is similar to Isaiah's response. Here I am, send me. Or Mary's, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Or Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. The end of verse 8 reads, your instructions are written on my heart. I love this poetic language. And, and we know that the heart was often seen as the seat of the will. So the psalmist is keeping God's law in his heart to indicate that he's submitting to God's will. In our 21st century context, we probably read this more as holding close to what we cherish the most putting aside all else for the thing we love dearly. May it be God's will that we hold dear above all. All right, let's, let's keep reading on. Verses 9 and 10. I have told all your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out as you, O Lord, well know. I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. I've talked about your faithfulness and saving power. I've told everybody, everyone in the great assembly of your unfailing love and faithfulness. The Hebrew here indicates that, that the good news is being told in a loud voice for everyone to hear. Uh, this historical circumstance was probably during one of the pilgrimage festivals in the temple. So David literally did this. He proclaimed this to the people. And nothing was going to stop David from telling of God's righteousness, faithfulness, and love. He's not going to be held back by apathy or ingratitude or fear of what people might think. Remember, this is David who danced in his underwear. He, he didn't care what people thought. But, but he's very open in celebrating the joy of his salvation. What God has done for him is, is not something that he just wants to contemplate on, think happy thoughts about just jot down in his gratitude journal, although those are all good things. He is vocally and publicly sharing his testimony of what God has done for him. And we should do similarly. Our faith is not actually an individual thing, or at least it's not meant to be. Our Christian faith is formed in community. That's why it's always referred to as the body. We're part of each other. We need each other. We, we, we need to hold each other accountable. We need to encourage and strengthen each other. When one is weak, the stronger lifts them up. Our public testimonies are to strengthen and encourage others. As the uh, theologian J. Lo rightly says, let's get loud. Apologies to all the introverts in the room who are like, let's get loud. Maybe not. 
but, but it, it's not so much the, the uh, volume of our, our testimony and our celebration, but the fact that we actually give testimony, we give celebration. We can do that through our own personalities. It doesn't all have to be Teresa loud. Uh, it can be Gavin at the sound desk loud. Sorry, honey, I shouldn't mention you. <clears throat> He's dancing on the inside. <laughs> and then we get to the second half of the psalm, and this is where it turns. We've had deliverance, we've had celebration, we've had testimony. But now it appears the psalmist, oh, David, he's in fresh trouble. He's a troublemaker, right? He's always, he's always in it. And, and once again, we don't know how bad it is. We don't know what the situation is. Is it as bad as the slimy pit? Is it worse? Is it better? Either way, it's serious enough that he is evoking some desperate pleas to God. At the beginning, I said that verses 1 through 10 were waiting rewarded. Verses 11 to 17 could be titled waiting renewed. That's the optimistic spin on it. It's basically waiting again. Let's read on from verse 11. Lord, don't hold back your tender mercies from me. Let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me, for troubles surround me, too many to count. My sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I have lost all courage. Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. We see again that David continues to testify to the Lord's faithfulness in verse 11. And he's already talked about God's saving power in verse 10. And now he appeals to God. You can hear his heart. He says, God, I need you to show these qualities again, for I'm surrounded. I'm in trouble. And these troubles, verse 12, they're too many to count. This time, some of those troubles seem to result, as, uh, to be a result of David's sin, as well as uh, the fear of his enemies. So he, he's struggling from outside. He's struggling from inside. He's utterly discouraged as he pleads with the Lord in verse 13 to come quickly. I think we can all relate to, to that desire. It's like, don't, don't hesitate, Lord. We, we need rescue now. Verses 14 and 15. May those who try to destroy me be humiliated and put to shame. May those who take delight in my trouble be turned back in disgrace. Let them be horrified by their shame. For they said, aha, we've got him now. So the psalmist is saying, God, disgrace my enemies. Uh, may their plots be exposed. May they be, uh, be put to shame. Verse 16. But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, The Lord is great. The Lord is great. Those who seek God will be encouraged and will rejoice and praise God when he shows mercy and saves his stressed out under attack servant. And, and we see this shout in verse 16, the Lord is great in contrast to the bully's sadistic, aha, we've got him now. Our shouts, the Lord is great, should be louder than the troubles against us. The psalm concludes with a humble yet confident request for the Lord's help in verse 17. As for me, since I am poor and needy, let the Lord keep me in his thoughts. You are my helper and my saviour, O oh my God, do not delay. There's no contradiction here between the assurance of God's help and urgent calls for it. David reminds us that even in our troubles, we can rest assured in God's saving power. Remember, we don't see as the world sees. This is kingdom perspective. And I, I find comfort in this psalm. I think our tendency would be to end on a high note of rescue, the woohoo, you know, the end of the battle of Helm's Deep. Yes, victory. God is so good. I'm sitting pretty. I'm on my solid rock. But we don't get that in this psalm. It's a bit of a dose of reality in a way. And I, I think that honesty actually gives me hope. 
because God doesn't change. We, we sung about it this morning, same God. But our circumstances, our circumstances are always in flux. Whether we're in the miry pit, whether we're standing on solid ground in joyful celebration or under fresh attack, maybe it's somewhere in between, maybe it's some of all of that all at once. Throughout it all, God is constant. God's character remains steadfast. When I'm in the pit, God is good. When I'm getting that mud out of my fingernails, God is good. When I'm celebrating in church and telling people about how God rescued me, God is good. When things start to go pear-shaped, God is good. And through it all, God's desire is that we continue to wait on Him. This is the hard bit. But remember, it's not a passive waiting. It's a looking keenly. It's a resting in His promises, on His character, on His word in Scripture. It's a call to be faithful and obedient even when we can't see it. Trusting that the God who rescued David from the worst of situations will not only do it for us, he will do it again and again and again and again because we need it. (laughs) We need it again and again. I hope that doesn't depress you, but this is life. We need it again. (laughs) And, And I love this beautiful image in verse 17. He's, as in God, he's keeping us in his thoughts. He hasn't forgotten you. He's thinking about you. He knows what you're going through. He's not scared. He's not stressed out, even when we are. He's got us. So where are our our eyes fixed? On the pit, like Homer trying to figure a way out on our own? Or are we looking keenly, like Aragorn, remembering Gandalf's message? Waiting proactively, knowing that we can trust God to deliver us safely. And while we wait, let's listen to someone else's uh, in our community as they testify to how God has rescued them. Let's, let's hear about God's deliverance in someone else's life to encourage us. Let's participate, participate in that celebration, not in envy, but in expectation that what God did for them, he will do for us. And then in turn, it will be our time to share testimony, to celebrate and to lift someone else up as we celebrate God's love and faithfulness. Let me pray for you before we go to table today. God, our God, we thank you that you are the same God who rescued David from the miry pit. Lord, we thank you that in every circumstance, you remain unchanged. And I just pray right now for those who are in a season of waiting, that they would not look at how they are stuck, but that they would keep their eyes fixed on you. Lord, would you write your word in our heart, that we would hold it close, that we would choose to be obedient even when it's tough. We love you. We thank you that you are a God who rescues us. Deliver us quickly. Do not delay. In Jesus' name, amen. Enjoy your time in Table Talk.